Well, it has been quite a month around our country. I think we would be willing to agree on together. If ever there was a time when we needed good news, when we needed the news of Easter, it's probably about now. I was so personally disheartened this week to hear the very sad news that the, uh, one of the first daughters of the former president was arrested this week and expelled from Harvard for a drug violation. I was just so sad that it's such a promising, uh, gifted young person had suffered a setback like that. And it was not good news, as you probably have heard, on the other side of the aisle either, as uh, the famed uh, Crayola uh, company, you may have heard, has decided to retire one of the most notorious of its colors, the dandelion yellow color, <laughs> because apparently some school children have, uh, well, they've been using that color to draw some very unflattering pictures of our current president. And there was a bit of pressure from the White House about this. And Crayola said, listen, we, we want unity in our country. We don't need this kind of thing. So they're doing away with the, the dandelion color. And speaking of hair, uh, <laughs> on the science front, we learned this week that um, conclusive research came out. It was aired in a significant website that demonstrates that women who have chemically treated hair uh, actually have higher self-esteem than women that do not color their hair, do, do not do anything. And that is going to prove very, very good for those of you who own stock in companies like Clairol and other hair products. And for all of you who are fans of Barney, are there one or two Barney fans in the room? Or yes, I see one right here. Or Aragon, perhaps. And certainly for those of you who follow Game of, Game of Thrones, scientists in uh, northern Iceland uncovered just this past month the, the remains of a huge reptilian creature of some kind that appears to have had a 60-foot wingspan which suddenly makes extremely plausible all of those legends we've been hearing for so many years about dragons. Now about now you're thinking to yourself, this is a little odd where this pastor is going. I don't understand what these stories have to do with Easter or even what these stories really have in common with each other. Well, this is what they have in common with each other. Every single one of those stories I just gave came out in some significant media outlet this past month. They each went viral as other people passed the stories on to others, and each of them uh, s spurred a whole cascade of follow-up stories and add-on stories that created even wider interest. And each one of those stories I've just told you is a lie. It is fake news. It is something that someone exaggerated for the sake of humor or to create some kind of clickbait that would get us to go to some marketing site or which was just pushed out there because it seemed to advance somebody's partisan or ideological agenda. Fake news. There's a lot of it in our time, which seems to me to beg a very important question on this particular day. Is Easter a story like that? Uh, is Easter just fake news? Is it just somebody's fantasy story, somebody's way of, of trumping up uh, a, a story that will bolster a, 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 a false cause? Is it somebody's way of building up their religion, but in reality is just a hoax? I think we need to ask ourselves that question honestly, because I don't think we can let Easter mean what it is meant to mean to us if we've not faced the big question about whether it's the true thing. Now, there were people, even back in the first century AD, who wondered these things themselves. There were people who were very skeptical about this whole resurrection thing. And uh, we're told by a reporter that after the execution of Jesus, the local religious authorities 
went to the Roman governor of the time and said this, and I quote, Sir, we remember that while Jesus was still alive, the deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. So, give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body. They might come and steal the body and then go tell people that he has been raised from the dead. Pilate answered, okay, take a guard and go and make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and they made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard there. In other words, we're going to make very sure there is no kind of event that's going to happen that could be spun in any way to create some kind of fake news about a resurrection. Then on Easter morning, some women uh, went early to the tomb. You know this story well. And upon arriving in the garden where the tomb was, the women, to their utter shock and surprise, found that the huge stone that had blocked the entrance of the tomb had been rolled away. And the body of Jesus was gone. And, and where the body had been were now just grave clothes lying there, uh, discarded like a chrysalis from which some new and superior kind of life had emerged. And in place of the, the hired guards now stood two gleaming messengers, and, and I quote, they say this, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you that the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. The women went and told all of these things to the eleven, the other disciples. Judas is gone now, they're not twelve anymore, just eleven. And to all of the others, but, and this is the important part, they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense like nonsense why nonsense why did this seem like nonsense because when you take an individual even a very robust individual and you flay them 39 times with a cat of nine, cat of nine tails and, and you and you rip practically the flesh from their skeleton and then you force them on a march through the streets of the city dragging and carrying a huge piece of lumber, a railroad tie on his back, and drive him all the way to the top of a hill and lay him down and drive iron nails into his body and then raise that cross up against the sky and you leave him there hanging there for hour and hour and hour after hour without any kind of, uh, of help or aid. And then you drive a Roman spear into his innards, and then you take him down and you mummify him. You wrap all kinds of fabric and spices around him until he's sealed up tight. He's swaddled so tight that even if he was the most alive human being, he wouldn't be able to move. When you do these kinds of things, the body does not get up again. It just doesn't. There's just no way. And even if somebody had somehow managed to to survive the incredible ordeals of Good Friday, that they just couldn't escape that condition in a sealed tomb of all things or, or, or ever take the time then to discard the grave clothes and walk out naked. It's just, this is not something that's going to happen. And there's no way that grave robbers are really the answer either because they're just not getting past highly trained, well-armed guards whose job it is upon pain of death to keep that place safe from any kind of robbers. So the body of Jesus couldn't be gone, like the women were saying. And it certainly couldn't be alive. That was nonsense. It had to be what? Fake news. 
It just had to be. Uh, from the point of view of even the disciples of Jesus at this point, it was just fake news. But what if it wasn't? What if it was not? A group of friends were at the wake of an old college buddy. And as they stood several feet away from the open casket where people were filing by, they got into sort of serious conversation. And um, one of them asked, you know, what do you want said about you when you're gone? Uh, when it's an event like this and you're the guest of honor. One of the guys said, you know, I hope that one of the things people will talk about is, is, is my career. That, you know, I had a long, successful career. I, I made a big difference. I hope they'll talk about all of the good that I did for other people. I hope that'll be one of the big themes. And, and the second one said, you know, for me, it's family. Uh, my, my real hope is that, that people will just talk about what a great dad and what a, a great spouse I was and how much I loved my family and how much they loved me. And the third friend thought for a moment, and he said, you know, those are both good things, but here's what I hope they'll say. Look, the body's moving. He's getting up. <laughs> who wouldn't want that to be true? You know, who wouldn't want that to be the case? Who wouldn't love it if, if it was true that there really was some kind of power for living, this life that was even stronger than the death towards which every one of us here are rushing. Who wouldn't want to think there's hope beyond our certain death ahead? Who wouldn't be excited if it turned out that, that there was a forgiving grace even greater than all of the sins that we've committed in our lives. And some of us, we got a doozy of a list. I do. I've got a doozy of a list of sins. And who wouldn't be thrilled to know that your life could be filled up with a love that is deeper than you've ever known before? The kind of love that just removes all insecurity in your life, that just makes you an agent of good in the world and allowed you to be part of changing this world in all of the ways it still needs change. What if that was not fake news? Wouldn't you like that? I mean, raise your hand if you'd like that. I know I would. Wouldn't we all? Well, on Easter afternoon, uh, there were two men who were walking away from Jerusalem toward the town of Emmaus. It was about seven miles uh, journey uh, away from Jerusalem. And the scripture says that they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And they were talking about all the events that had gone on in Jerusalem in the last several days. And as they're going along, and there's a whole bunch of people on this Emmaus road, and uh, a stranger sort of sidles up alongside of them and, and strikes up a conversation and asks um, where they're going and, and what their week has been like. And, and they tell him that they had been amongst the followers of this rabbi from Nazareth. They had seen this rabbi um, live in such a way and treat people in such a way and, and teach in such a way that the hope had grown up in them that maybe this guy was the Messiah. The, the long-promised liberator, the one whose grace and power and love and life could bring about a transformation in the nation of Israel and a change in their own lives that they were hoping for. And they put it this way. They say, we had hoped he was the one to redeem Israel. All of us hope for redemption. Right? Redemption is about the renewal of things. It's about the restoration of, of things, the resurrection of things into a condition that, that's beautiful and good and lasting. Who of us doesn't wish for the redemption of America even now and of our own lives in certain ways? Uh, but the strangers go on to say that this Jesus they had put their hope in had met this awful, humiliating, agonizing end, and yet 
there was this bizarre rumors that it was now moving around. This, these women had come from his tomb, and they were reporting that maybe he was actually alive. <laughs> it, was, it was hard to believe. It was a crazy idea. And yet as the sun was setting, and these two uh, men got uh, to their destination, they asked the stranger to stay behind and just have a meal with us. It's been good to get to know you. And as the They're sitting at the table and they're breaking bread together. The stranger begins to talk about the ancient scriptures and how they had pointed towards certain events, including the suffering death of the Messiah and his resurrection from the grave. And suddenly, as they're sitting at this table, the eyes of these two men are opened up and they realize that they are in the presence and had been in the presence now for hours of Jesus, of the risen Lord Jesus. Now this was not the only group of people to whom this kind of an experience occurred. We know from the accounts that Mary and the other women would actually meet the risen Jesus. Not just the empty tomb anymore. They'd actually encounter Jesus in the flesh. We know that the other disciples would encounter Christ apparently risen from the grave, not just once, but multiple times uh, over these next days. A crowd of 500 people at one time. 500 folks just involved in other activities would suddenly look and see the person of the risen Jesus of Nazareth. And the risen Christ would appear so convincingly to a Christian hater by the name of Saul, a a, a Pharisee who made it his purpose to wipe out this little cult, to, to, to imprison, torture, and kill as many of the followers of the Nazarene as he could. Jesus would appear so convincingly to this man that it would transform him into the Apostle Paul and make him the greatest champion of the Christian movement and the Christian gospel the world has ever seen. And it would set aflame a life-changing, civilization-shaping movement that would stretch out across the centuries and advance the cause of justice and women and hope and flourishing all across planet Earth over the centuries to come till it reached down one day into a, a church building or into a home And it wrapped its hands of grace around your life and my life and caught us up in the amazing story of Easter. A Sunday school teacher was sitting with her kids in class one day and she gave them an assignment. She said, what does Easter mean to you? You might think about that question for yourselves. Uh, and the kids were asked to, to, to write an essay, a short essay about this. What, is, what does Easter mean to me? Dot, dot, dot. Easter means to me. One little boy's answer was, Easter means to me jelly beans and egg salad sandwiches for the next two weeks. <laughs> is that what Easter means mainly to us? Nothing against jelly beans. I'm going to have a few of them today. But is it just about egg salad for the next two weeks? What would you write down if you had that assignment? In fact, I want to encourage you over brunch today or before the day's over, ask the people around to fill in the blank. This is what Easter means to me. To paraphrase C.S. Lewis, Easter, if false, is of no importance. And, if true, is of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. Think about that. It's the only thing it can't be. I mean, if Easter is just fake news, then you can do what you want with Christianity because Christianity is entirely founded on Easter, on the idea that Jesus was the one true God come in the flesh. (laughs) And the vindication or the validation of that truth, that central idea, is Easter. It was the resurrection of Christ from the grave that would demonstrate that he was who he said he was 
and that everything he had said to us about life could be depended upon. So if that's just fake news, then you just do what you want with Christianity. Pick and choose the beliefs that you like from it as if you were going down a buffet line and just throw away the stuff you don't want or invent your own religion. Or, or, or throw religion out altogether and be an atheist if that's your choice. Because it doesn't matter. If Easter is fake news, then here is the naked truth. You are going to be that body at the wake. And I am too. And we will not move. And they will close the casket. And they'll put us in the ground and it will all be over. If, if Easter is false then the reality is those things that we have done in our lives, and you know what? Some of us have done things so humiliating and bad, our friends, our closest friends, our family don't know about it. We would be horrified to have them even know about it. If that is the truth, then those things and all of the other ways that we failed and the losses of our life, they're going with us to that grave. They're not getting fixed. They're not getting redeemed. And in the meantime, we're just going to have to hope that the politicians and the scientists can fix the world. Because obviously there's no power to do that beyond us. And if they can't do it, then maybe there'll be enough entertainments, enough anesthetics to make the ride bearable until we plunge over into the grave ourselves. If Easter isn't true. That's the reality. That's the world that we're living in. But if, if Easter is true, then that's a different reality altogether, and it is a lot more than moderately important. I hope you can see that. I mean, it means there is a life stronger than death. It means you do not need to be afraid of that funeral ahead. And that many of the people that you have loved in this life, who you have lost, you are going or could be going to see again if this is true. If Easter is true, it means there is a grace that is greater than any failure in your life or any loss that you've experienced in your life. Because the redeeming work that Jesus did upon the cross has power to it. Your slate is clean. You have been washed of the implications and the final guilt of those sins, you can start totally new today. Every day you can rise to a new Easter morning in a sense and begin afresh, confident that God is going to make one day all things new. If Easter is true, then it proves there is a love greater and deeper than we've ever even dared to imagine. And that love can change your life for the better. It, it can take away the insecurities and the anxieties that drive us so much of the time and fill us with an absolute confidence and can make us agents of blessing in the lives of other people to shape this world for good in the years to come. If Easter is true, what do you think? Is it true? What do you think? What does Easter mean to you? One of my very favorite uh, films of this past year was the movie Arrival. Any of you get a chance to see it? In the story, Amy Adams plays a, um, a linguistic scientist, a specialist in the area of, of language. And she's been called in because this huge, mysterious alien presence has suddenly descended up upon the earth. And the entire military and governmental and scientific and public communities are just a, a Twitter with all of this and, and not knowing what to make of it. Well, as time goes by, pretty much uh, everybody is starting to come to the conclusion that this arrival represents the greatest threat that human beings have ever faced. It's Independence Day all over again in effect. It is obviously, this alien presence is obviously here to take over our planet or to control us or to kill us. And we need to destroy this monster before it destroys us. And, and, there's a, and la the launch is about to start across all the continents to, to destroy this alien presence. And yet, 
the Amy Adams character comes to a different conclusion. She takes this, she looks at all the dots differently and connects them differently than the others are doing, and she believes that this alien arrival heralds something else altogether. She believes that this is the human race's opportunity, its greatest opportunity to learn from a vast intelligence and power that has come to us from the future, not to destroy us, but to bless us. to share the riches of its capacity with us. And so she gets that whether we choose to embrace or reject this arrival is infinitely important for our future. And, and the choice she makes to act on that belief and the leadership she exercises to invite others to embrace this possibility and live towards it alters civilization for millennia to come in glorious ways, in life-enhancing ways. Likewise, what we do with Easter, the God who reaches out to us on Easter matters a whole lot more than moderately. And I respect that some of you who are listening to me today, you struggle with this. You maybe got dragged to the service. I've got feeling for you. I sat in that seat once. I used to get dragged to services like this. And you're struggling with, with this whole Easter thing because you don't even believe in God much less this whole thing that is purported to have occurred at that empty tomb. Maybe the evidence isn't convincing enough to you yet, or maybe you think that if you actually opened yourself up to this whole thing, it would subject you to being controlled, managed, uh, strictured and structured by some narrow religion, and you want nothing of that. Maybe you'll show up at Easter and Christmas and special occasions, but keep me away from that stuff. Beyond that, you think, and if that's where you sit, if that's who you are, I understand that. But if that is so, let me invite you to consider what has become known as Pascal's Wager. Pascal, Blaise Pascal, was a, a brilliant Frenchman of the 17th century. He was one of this world's greatest mathematicians, philosophers, a man whose impact in those fields, in physics and economics and social science, are still talked about today, still exerting an influence on those fields. And Pascal said that everybody needs to decide at some point what to do with God. And they need to make a conscious choice about what they're going to do with God. And, and the reason they need to make the conscious choice is because the stakes are high. It's not moderately important, is what Pascal said. And this is how he puts his wager. If you believe in the God of Easter, and he turns out to exist, if you believe, and he turns out to exist, then you gain all of the advantages of his fellowship, what he can teach you and do in you and through you in this life, and you gain heaven in the life beyond this life. In other words, you gain an infinite benefit. An infinite benefit. Or, if you don't believe in God, and it turns out he exists, you miss out on the opportunity of what his intelligence and power could have done for you, in you, and through you. And you don't go to heaven. You're separated from that God for all of eternity. In other words, an infinite loss. And if you follow, if you choose to follow the way of Jesus in this life, and it turns out that God doesn't exist, then you will have had a better life than you probably would have had by following some other way than the way of Jesus, and you lose nothing in the end. You lose nothing at all. In other words, those who believe in the God of Easter have everything to gain, nothing to lose, 
And those who reject Easter as just another case of fake news have everything to lose and nothing to gain. It's not moderately important, this decision. So hear the good news. Hear the wonderful news that I hope will make a difference in your life today, will keep you coming back to this church or some other fellowship of of followers of Jesus in the days to come. The greatest intelligence and goodness in the universe has arrived. He's arrived on this earth, lived a life in our shoes, done a transforming, redeeming work, rose from the grave, and reigns in this world through the power of his Holy Spirit right now. He's available to you right now. He has come to offer you a life stronger than death, a grace greater than any sin and loss in your life, and a love deeper than you've ever known before. And he came back to earth and back from the grave on Easter for this one purpose, to show you who he really is, what his heart is like, and to bless you and to bless others through you. So the question is, what will you do with the invitation he issues to you? How will you wager yourself in this life? What does this Easter really mean for you today? What will it mean next week, next weekend for you? I pray that it means a whole lot more than some leftover stale jelly beans and two weeks of egg salad. I really do. Because here's the truth. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. And he has said and does say right now to each and every one of us, come unto me, for I am the resurrection and the life. And I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Would you please pray with me? Great God, we thank you for the great hope of Easter. We remember your words and your invitation. And each of us in our own way responds to you now. Move us by the power of your Holy Spirit into your arms. And as we've grown close to your heart, out into the world again to be the force of blessing for which you've sent us. For this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.